everyone and welcome to Walking Through the Bible. If you were asked to describe the spiritual state of the pagan kings in the time of the Persian Empire, what would you say? Idolatrous? Evil? A threat to Israel? Well, many certainly were idolatrous, and in that regard, in the, in the eyes of God, were evil in terms of salvation. However, just because one is not saved does not automatically mean that the person cannot perform good deeds, even if those good deeds do not earn them salvation. You see, unlike in the past, where the idolatrous kings of the foreign nations were a threat to the nation of Israel's existence, things were drift different of the Persians. In Esther, Daniel, and here in Ezra and Nehemiah, the Persian kings were tolerant of the worship of Jehovah and even offered sacrifices to him and therefore allowed Israel to worship him. In fact, they encouraged Israel to do so. And that's what we found here in Ezra 7 thus far. So, if you have a Bible with you, you can turn to Ezra chapter 7. We're going to be reading from verses 21 through 28. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry. Just follow along with us on the screen. The version that we'll be reading from is the New King James Version. So, Ezra chapter 7, beginning at verse 21. And I, even I, Artaxerxes, the king, issue a decree to all the treasurers who are in the region beyond the river, that whatever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of, God, of the God of heaven, may require of you, let it be done diligently, up to 100 talents of silver, 100 cores of wheat, 100 baths of wine, 100 baths of oil, and salt without prescribed limit. Whatever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it, be, let it diligently be done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? Also we inform you that it shall, be, it shall not be lawful to impose tax, tribute, or custom on any of the priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, Nethanim, or servants of this house of God. And you, Ezra, according to, the, according to your God, given wisdom, set magistrates and, judge, and judges who may judge all the people who are in, in the region beyond the river, all such as know the laws of your God, and teach those who do not know them. Whoever will not observe the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily on him, whether it be death or banishment or confiscation of goods or imprisonment. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, who has put such a thing as this into the king's heart, to beautify the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem, and has extended mercy to me before the king and his counselors, and before all the king's mighty princes." So I was encouraged, as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me, and I gathered leading men of Israel to go up with me. Artaxerxes, which we said a couple lessons ago is Artaxerxes Longmanus of Persia, is sending Ezra back to Israel from Persia. The year is about 458 BC. Artaxerxes, though, is not sending Ezra back simply to be with his people. He is sending him back on a mission to inquire about how the nation of Judah is doing. By this point, Judah had been back in the Promised Land for about 80 years. The temple had been rebuilt, though that took 20 years to accomplish. What Ezra should be finding is that the temple work is going smoothly and that Judah is following the law of Moses that had been handed down to them almost a millennia before. But is that what Ezra would find? That's what Artaxerxes wanted to know. Now, why would Artaxerxes have wanted knowledge concerning this? Because after all, Jehovah wasn't his nation's God, he was Judah's. Well, from today's reading, we learn that at the very least, Artaxerxes recognized Jehovah as the God of heaven, one who could bring wrath down upon him and his sons. Did this mean that Artaxerxes saw Jehovah as the only God of heaven? Well, that is uncertain, for the Persians were an idolatrous people, like the Babylonians that came before them. But at the very least, he didn't deny Jehovah's existence like the Assyrians did in the days of Hezekiah. And because of this belief, Artaxerxes didn't want to anger Jehovah by impeding the worship of him by his people Judah. But even more than that, he also wanted to ensure that he was favored before Jehovah as well, which is why he sent his own offering with Ezra to be offered at the temple in Jerusalem. Now you might ask, where would Artaxerxes have come to this conclusion that Jehovah exists in the first place? Unfortunately, the answer to this would have been more clear had the book of Esther been placed before Ezra and Nehemiah in our Bibles instead of after. For when we get to that book, 
we'll find that those events take place during the reign of Artaxerxes' father, Xerxes. And from the content of that book, we know that the Persians, Persian witnessed Jehovah's power firsthand in saving the Jews from the hand of Haman. Artaxerxes would have been born at this time, so it is likely that his faith stemmed from those events. Again, was it enough for him to view Jehovah as the only God? We don't know. We'll leave that up to God to judge. For us, it is only important that we recognize that Artaxerxes had the faith to act here and sent Ezra back to inquire about the goings-on in Judah. Ezra would have authority given by the king to spend up to a certain amount to ensure that whatever was needed to be done was done in order to fulfill the king's commands. Ezra would have the, the power to set up magistrates and judges according to the wisdom given him by Jehovah who may judge Judah. These magistrates and judges would still be under Persian rule, but they would have the authority to enforce the law of Moses on Judah. Ezra would also have the authority to teach the law of Moses to those who didn't know it in his nation, something we will see in future chapters. And whoever wouldn't follow the law of Moses in Judah, Ezra had the power to have put to death, to banish, to confiscate goods, and to imprison whichever was required by Ezra. This is how serious Artaxerxes was in his mission that he gave Ezra. Ezra wouldn't just have the power to observe. He would have the power to act as well in the name of the king. As for his rulers, Artaxerxes declared that it would not be lawful for, for them to tax the priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, Nethanim, or servants of the temple. This concession would have been quite costly to the king, but we must remember that under the law of Moses, the priests and Levites were supported by the tithes of the people, for they did not own land themselves. Therefore, to tax them would be to tax what would amount to as the charity of the people, something that Artaxerxes thought would not be right. All of these actions by Artaxerxes encouraged Ezra to do that which the king had commanded him. But Ezra didn't glorify Artaxerxes for his actions. He glorified God. He recognized that God's providence was at work and that although God did not force Artaxerxes to act in this way, he did show his works to Artaxerxes such that, with an open heart, Artaxerxes produced enough faith to act in this way. We're going to learn a little bit more about Ezra's journey to Judah in chapter 8, something that we will start to study, Lord willing, in the next lesson. With that, our time is up for today. The Lord willing, we hope you'll join us for tomorrow's discussion of Ezra chapter 8, verses 1 to 14, as we continue our walk through the Bible, one verse at a time. We thank you for watching Walking Through the Bible today. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave them below. But if you like this video, we ask that you consider subscribing to our channel so you won't miss out on other videos in our series, as well as share this video among your friends so that the saving message of Jesus Christ can go out to the whole world.